Stephen Covey, Chairman and Founder of the Covey Leadership Center, renowned author, lecturer, teacher, and leadership mentor. For more than 30 years, Dr. Covey has trained thousands of prominent industry, education, and government figures in management, leadership, organizational development, and time management tools. Dr. Covey's universally acclaimed book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, has sold over 13 million copies in 32 languages and was on the New York Times bestseller list for 270 weeks. Chief Executive Magazine readers named The Seven Habits the most influential business book of the 20th century. Prior to finding his calling as a leadership sage and coach, Dr. Covey earned his doctorate at Brigham Young University, his MBA at Harvard Business School, and his Bachelor of Science from the University of Utah. Please join me in welcoming to award one of Time Magazine's top 25 most influential Americans, talented, dynamic Dr. Stephen Covey. Well, I'm really thrilled to be with you. These people that would like to have some seats, and if you get bored, you can walk out, but you can come sit here if you want rather than stand. It's up to you what you want to do, but there's plenty of other seats here. you're interested in some of my ideas on leadership so why don't I open up with some of them and then um, let's open it up for interaction because I really enjoy the interaction the most and I think you would too um, I sure feel for you people <laughs> for a second, experiment with something for a minute. Close your eyes without any peeking at all. Point north. Don't peek. Point north. Keep, keep, keep pointing. Now open your eyes. See where people are pointing. And just like this, this way, this way, this way, that way, that way. There's someone this way. <laughs> I will guarantee you, you can go to about any organization you want and just ask one simple question. What is the purpose of your organization? It'll be just about like what you saw. We're working with 800 of the Fortune 1000. So I do it all the time. People are not on the same song sheet. The essence of leadership is to get people pointing in the same direction. Otherwise, you've got to manage them. If you can get a culture behind a common vision and a common value system, people will manage themselves. The key is to lead people, manage things. People have the freedom and power to choose, things don't. So leadership is a reciprocal choice between the leader and the follower form of mutual influence taking place. How to get them on the same song sheet is the real challenge of leadership. The key to it 
in my judgment, is first modeling absolute trustworthiness. Trust is the function of trustworthiness. Have you ever seen anyone try to talk themselves out of a problem they behaved themselves into? Have you ever tried it? Have you ever seen a company try to PR itself out of a problem it behaved itself into? Trust is the fruit of trustworthiness. So modeling is the first role of leadership. What that produces is personal moral authority. People trust you. They know that you'll keep your commitments. I was coming across the border up in uh, Toronto a while back, and I saw a great deal on the leather coat, and I said to the proprietor of the store, he had two salesmen standing next to him, how much duty do I have to pay? He said, nothing, just wear it. I said, yeah, but the form requires you to declare everything you acquired abroad. Don't worry about it. <laughs> just wear it, everyone does. It's called personal effects. It's okay. Yeah, but you signed the form declaring what you've said is truthful. Those are the very words. He said, Mr. Covey, don't worry. No one will even question. I said, you know what really worries me? Is how the two gentlemen standing by you worry about how you manage their careers and their commission arrangements. I'm telling you, all three just stood in stunned silence. You could see the blood flow coming up the back of the head. On me, you could see it going over the head. <laughs> if you want to achieve and maintain the loyalty of people who are present, always be loyal to those who are absent then people know that you're not a function of your environment. You're a function of your integrity toward a set of principles. That produces trustworthiness and trust. And that's the glue to organizations. Without it, almost everything else is weakened by it. We asked 3,500 of our client organizations, what's holding back quality? And these were already organizations into the quality movement. Number one issue is low trust. And number two issue is communication. And what is communication but low trust? When trust is high, communication is effortless, it's easy, it's instantaneous, and it works. When it's low, it'll never work, no matter how clear you are. <clears throat> The essence of communication is trust. The essence of trust is trustworthiness. That's the first role I suggest of leadership. I'm going to go through four of them. The second role is pathfinding. How you get everyone pointing in the same direction. Regarding vision, mission, and values. The third role is to institutionalize the moral authority. That is, the principles that produced the personal moral authority get built into the structures and systems so that if you say that you value cooperation, you reward cooperation. If you say that you value all stakeholders, you do 360 degree feedback. You don't just study financial accounting. If you say that you value democracy, you practice it. If you say you value free enterprise, you don't practice feudalism. That is, your public and your private life are totally based on the same set of principles. And that the institution is also. That produces institutionalized moral authority. A year ago, the President of the United States was impeached in the House of Representatives. The next day, he received scores of standing ovations in the same exact location for the State of the Union, many of them bipartisan. Why? Institutionalization of moral authority. 
Saddam Hussein promised his sons-in-laws that if they would return home from um, molding the country during the Gulf War, they would be forgiven. Return to the bosom of the family. You will have amnesty. Shot them both that afternoon. Why? No institutionalized moral authority. So the third role is the alignment of structures and systems and processes to be in harmony with the vision and the values of the organization. That institutionalizes, see, the moral authority that, that uh, was personalized in the first role. That doesn't mean it's yet enculturated. That's the fourth role. The creation of an empowered culture so that people focus upon outcomes and desired results and are free to choose their methods within the guidelines of legality, ethicality, the vision and the values, then it releases the potential that is inside them. And you focus primarily on their talents. And you organize to make their weaknesses irrelevant. I was very interested coming over here to hear about your team learning. I think that is so important and so valuable you're having team learning experiences and team projects because the world is very interdependent. My MBA program totally focused on independence. And if you move with an independent mindset into an interdependent world, it's like playing tennis with a golf club. You can do it, but it just doesn't work well. Modeling, pathfinding, aligning, um, empowering, I suggest are the four basic roles of leadership. Why don't we open it up a little? Questions? I'm a teacher, so I have long wait time. <laughs> I would love to teach at your university. Yes? Make it loud enough so everyone can hear if you would, and make it brief. Okay. <clears throat> Gallup did a fantastic study of the most successful managers in hundreds and hundreds of organizations. And they developed a report written up in the book, First Break All the Rules. The basic concept is that most people have focused upon people's weaknesses and then they train for those weaknesses instead of to find their strengths and then to utilize their strengths and where they are weak, you supply someone else's strength. That's why companies outsource more and more so that they can achieve world-class excellence in every area. I have a client one time that said to me, I don't know what to do with this person. He's our number one salesperson, but everyone hates him because his paperwork is so terrible. And the office staff stays up condemning him all night long at the end of every month to get his paperwork accurate and complete. <laughs> and we're ready to fire him, and he's ready to quit. But he's our number one salesperson. <laughs> get him some help, someone who's good at paperwork. If we did that, other people would ask. Tell them they'll get help, too. And the man was making 400000 a year. Build on strengths, organize to make weaknesses irrelevant. The number one problem in small businesses, how many of you are interested in entrepreneurship when you finish up? The number one problem is they try to clone. Always surround yourself with differences. 
value, celebrate the differences. Find out what you're good at, organize by getting other people's strengths to compensate for your weaknesses. That was a hard learning for me. I was a professor 15 years ago and decided to leave to set up a business. I wanted to kind of do it my way. I came to realize that what I like doing is working with ideas, writing, and teaching, not managing. Management to me is like the pounding surface, just one big problem after another. And you come up, and then oh, comes another one, and then it knocks you down, and then you come, oh, there's another one. So I decided to build a complementary team of people that could do what I couldn't do well, because I didn't enjoy it. I had no passion about it. In fact, the number one question to ask someone when you're hiring someone is, what did you really like doing in your life that you did well? Tell me about it when you were in grade school, junior high, high school, college, your present work. What do you really like doing that excites you? That you don't need any supervision or management at all, that you do well. Now organize around that. By the way, I'll tell you how to get any job you want. I'm serious. But maybe you're not yet interested in that. What year are you? You're in your second year? So you're looking for jobs, right? OK, I've given this council scores of MBA students in many MBA programs around this country. Only about one in 10 will do what I'm counseling. But I'm telling you, you do it, you'll get the job you want. And where you want it. You don't have to get focused on where's the soft job market, where's the, where's the market that's really ripe and so forth, where's the low hanging fruit. You can decide, what is it I want? That's the first of all decisions, decide what is it that you are passionate about and that you're really good at, you love doing. Where do I want to do that? What kind of people do I want to be around? So forth. you decide. The simple solution is this. Be a solution, not a problem. If I come and apply to you for a job and develop a beautiful resume, and if I send out a thousand letters, you're a problem. I want to join his firm. I come knowing your customers, your culture, your suppliers, your industry, how the economy and the new rules of the economy is impinging on your industry and your company. I know your figures. I know your numbers. I also know what I want to do, what your needs are. So when I talk to you, I say, I'm a still a student trying to understand. But my understanding of your industry, your company, your suppliers, your customers, their needs, their wants in the future, the projected trends, I've done such homework on your business that it will blow you away. You cannot believe someone would come that prepared. I'd like to suggest that my unique talent and skill and experience can meet this, because this excites me. I had two nephews, both going to MBA up in Michigan, MBA. I taught them both this. Neither of them believed it. I said, OK, go out and send out your resumes and go do your interviews. But come back to me when you decide you want to get the job you really want. So they said, OK, we'll do it. What do you want? I want to work for a big PR agency in Chicago. It's a very soft market. No one's hiring. You got the job. You can do it. Pay the price. Exercise the discipline. Get the mastery. Make the presentation. And he did it. The other one said, I want to work for a media company in Salt Lake. That's where I live, and that's where I want to go back. You got it. Study, do your homework, make the presentation, you get it. Both of them got the jobs they wanted. You can do this anytime you want. 
The problem is most people won't pay the price to discipline themselves to do that kind of homework. It's your life. It's your career. You're going to be spending years in it. Look at the work you do for a major paper. <laughs> and this is your future life. You can decide where you want. This is personal leadership. Modeling, pathfinding, what is it I really want, aligning resources, time, interest, and empowering yourself to do it. Not waiting for people to act on you. Not waiting for people to respond to your letters that you sent out. Not signing up for interviews at the placement center. Go ahead and do that if you want. Get a little experience. But you have to decide, what is the job I want? Really, most people have never done that. If you want a great book on this subject, read the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? by Richard Bowles. It's updated annually. It's fantastic. It teaches you how to get to know yourself. You can give interests and aptitude tests. I'm sure you can get it right here at Wharton. Interests and aptitude tests that tell you a lot about yourself. It'll identify the many options that are out there that fulfill those desires. Then all you have to do is do your homework, just like you did on the paper, to make the right presentation. It's the people you work with and around, by the way. It's very, very significant. So go inside that organization and interview people. In fact, let them interview you. Say, I'm very interested in learning about your culture, learning what your trust level is, and how people are empowered or disempowered. If you want to test the empowerment in an organization, just throw them out of their SOPs. That'll tell you fast whether or not they're empowered or not. If they own your problem and do what it takes to solve the problem, you've got an empowered culture. You walk into a Ritz-Carlton and uh, throw them any problem you want. You may be a guest or not and see what they do. You go return something in a Nordstrom's, whether you bought it there or not, and just see what they do. And you'll see what an empowered culture is like. And that's why self-empowerment is the key. Always get your head out of the weaknesses of other people. Never obsess about weaknesses of people or institutions. It's OK to be aware, but don't obsess about it. Otherwise, you just, in a sense, disempower yourself and empower their, strength, their weakness to continue to mess your life up. Your life is never a function. Your emotional life is never a function of how people treat you. It's a function of your own personal moral authority your integrity to your own value system. Then you're rather free and independent of human treatment. You'll have the power to be both courageous and empathic at the same time, as you learn about companies that you want to consider your career with. Other questions on this? Or? Yes, sir. Who are, who are some of the leaders that you admire, and what are some of the tactical things they do that, that demonstrate the principles that uh, for example, Jack Welsh, who writes notes to all his managers all the time. And uh, gets 360 degree review on himself. Took him four years to develop a common set of criteria where everyone knew what North was. Also, talk about alignment. Someone said, how have you increased stock value 13 times in 13 years? He said, aligning. reward systems to values. Not just numbers, but the full living of the values. I had a great experience just a few months ago with the president of Korea, President Kim. He's the Nelson Mandela of Asia. And he literally allowed me to teach him and his cabinet. We'd already trained most of his bureaucracy and his managers, so that's why they created the opening. And as I was teaching about building your life on principles, he said, Dr. Covey, you don't even know if those are your principles until you are prepared to die for them. And he was. For many years, he was in exile, he was punished, he was tortured. The North Korean junta attempted to bribe him to take the presidency. He knew it would be a pseudo-democracy. They threatened to take his life. He said, then do it. If you do it, I will die once. But if I cooperate with you, I will die 100 times every day for the rest of my life. They captured him while he was in exile in Japan, put him in a bag, threw rocks in the bottom of the bag, threw him in the China Lake. 
President Reagan had the CIA watching him the whole time during this exile. Like a James Bond operation, came down, swooping down with a hook, picked him up out of the water. Two weeks ago, or about a month ago, I had a tremendous experience with the leader on the SS Santa Fe, running a nuclear sub. I just finished training all of the admirals in the Pacific Fleet, and they gave me the privilege of going on a nuclear sub for a day. One billion dollar asset. <laughs> Couldn't hardly believe it. Um, run by a person under 40. And most of the people were 18, 19, 20 years old. And they said, watch this man's style. They couldn't believe the level of empowerment. Someone would come up and say, sir, I intend to take this boat 800 feet. What's the sounding say? 2,000. What about the sonar? There's no ships around. Give us 15 more minutes. That was his decision to make, see. They had made it and with an intention. I asked those seamen, what's it like living with the skipper versus the other skippers you've been with? We add value. They live in a hellhole. It's very claustrophobic. Nine people in the size of a room the size of my bathroom. 30 inch wide beds, big men. One gets out, another climbs in. 16 hour work days seven days a week, some deployments for weeks, months. But they add value. They contribute significantly to, to the national defense effort. We did war games, shot all 12 missiles, shot all four torpedoes, simulated realities. Fascinating to see the level of empowerment of this leader. Nelson Mandela is a favorite of mine. 27 years in prison. All moral authority comes from sacrifice. I'm convinced of it. Study anyone that has personal or has institutionalized moral authority, you'll see sacrifice behind it. 27 years in prison. He comes out. He walks down the center aisle for his own presidential inauguration in the new South Africa. Over here are the jailers in the seats of honor. His jailers. If you've read his autobiography, The Long Road to Freedom, you know how some of them treated him. He bows to them. He's so mellowed out in his spirit, is so forgiving, so reconciling. Then he brings the ANC choir to sing the Afrikaner anthem, and the Afrikaner choir to sing the ANC anthem. Then he appoints 100 peace committees, mostly black women, some of whom I've helped train, to identify and defuse the hot issues. We had her at an international symposium a year ago, Mrs. Sadat. Never had the privilege of meeting him. I've been to Camp David. I've seen exactly where that was signed. Very inspiring place. And I asked her, what was it like at the time of Camp David? Your, your, your husband totally took a 180 degree turn. How did he do that? She said, I didn't know myself. I was totally shocked by it. I went up and talked to him in the apartment of their palace, where he was the president of Egypt, and said, hey, someone said that you're thinking of going to Israel. He said, yeah, I am. You've been screaming all over this country. You'd never shake the hand of an Israeli as long as they occupy one inch of Arab soil. And chant, never, never, never. And then large groups in this macho nationalistic chant, never, never see. He said, I was wrong. This is right to do. He didn't use my language, but this is what he was saying. You cannot think independently in an interdependent world. She said, you'll lose the support of the Arab nations. See, Egypt is the leader of the Arab world. You'll lose the support. I hope not, but it could happen. You will lose the presidency of your country. That could happen. You will lose your life. He looked at her and said, my life is ordained. It won't be one minute longer or one minute shorter than it was ordained to be. And as you know, he did lose his life. 
And uh, I said, what was it like when he finished? When, when he came back home? She said, normally it takes a half an hour to get home. It took three and a half hours. The place was lined with hundreds of thousands of people. The same people that were chanting, never, 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 were chanting how happy they were that he had done this. People deep into their souls know principles that are universal, timeless, and self-evident. They know them. They're not unique to any religion, to any culture. They are universal. In our international conferences, we can gather the people together, and if they develop mission statements that come out of the bowels of the organization, they are all the same. An educator from South America, a CEO from North America, a military person from Asia, I just presented over in Saudi Arabia, teaching totally from the Quran. It's all there. The principles are universal. People know them. Leadership is what Gandhi did. He identified with the deepest hunger of the soul and the kinds of sacrifices that would help the principles that would fulfill that hunger be fulfilled. Until he developed such moral authority, he brought England to its knees and liberated three 150 million Indians, and he never held a position. Leadership has nothing to do with position. That's management. Leadership is a choice. My parents were great models and leaders to me that influenced me because they gave so much unconditional love and such integrity. In fact, on my mother's tombstone, we put the statement from Shakespeare. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, I scorn to change my state with kings. Anyway, those are some of the leaders I admire so much. What do you think MBA students could be doing to become better leaders? What do I think MBA students could do to become better leaders? First, write a personal mission statement and live by it. So that your life is a function of your values, not a function of your environment. Second, really take full advantage of your learning opportunities here. Get out of trying to psych the system out. Don't obsess about weaknesses in teachers or systems or administrators. You're aware, but don't obsess. It isn't the poisonous snake that bites you that does the serious harm. It's chasing that sucker that drives the poison to the heart. <laughs> Really take advantage of your opportunities. Get to know your professors that challenge you the most. Take tough classes. Have tough assignments. Be totally prepared to go the distance so that you develop the capacity, emotional, mental. Don't waste time on things that are urgent but not important. Half the time of business executives is spent on things that are urgent but not important, and they will acknowledge it right off the bat. Most report forms are never read. Most meetings don't need to be held. The other half could be cut in half. Just such waste taking place. People don't know how to focus on that which is important. When you develop a personal mission statement, you define what's important, what matters most to you. Everything else you can say no to. You smile a lot and say no, pleasantly, cheerfully, happily, guilt-free, no. <laughs> Including some classes that are worthless to you. If you have to meet a certain minimum in order to pass, OK, but I wouldn't give your heart to them. I would get, try to get the job that really would tap into your excitement, your passion, and your conscience. I wouldn't do work that does not add value, even if you make money. 
I would do work which significantly adds value to society. I would make money a lesser criterion. I would put the significance of the contribution, the quality of the people, the learning environment, and the congeniality with my family and lifestyle much higher than I would salary and benefits. I would watch very little television. <laughs> I would not waste time. Those are some of the things. <laughs> you used poetry a moment ago. I wonder if you could give us another example or two of some uh, poems or poetry that, that uh, inspire you or that are good examples of leadership. I'll complete that poem. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, with this man's art or that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, content at least. And then my heart, like the lark at daybreak arising, sings hymns at heaven's gate, for thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, I scorn to change my state with kings. Yeah. What do you think uh, your personal strengths and integrity comes from when, when the uh, life gets really tough and difficult? What, what drives you in, internal fire? When things get really difficult, what keeps you going in a fire going mission? I have such a strong sense of mission. And I have no desire at all to retire. I never will. I'm convinced that you should waste and wear out your life trying to make a contribution. The greatest contribution I want to make, frankly, is to strengthen the families. To me, that's more important than any other organization there is. No one on their deathbed wishes they spent more time at the office. Tomorrow night, I speak at the Washington Cathedral, all on families. I'm, in a, I, I'm trying to get every family to adopt one other family that is struggling that is dysfunctional, or one kid that has no chance unless someone invests in them. Sandra and I have psychologically adopted many, many families. I think it's so important that we invest in families, because the root source of almost 90%, I would say, of all our problems in society come from the weakening of the fabric of the family. She's talking about a number of leaders that follow their mission statement, but it really is not good for society. If I had an opportunity to teach those four roles, you know, I would put at the center of it a compass. I have under my watch a compass. I think all mission statements should be based upon conscience, principles. This way is north. <laughs> not this way. No, it is straight on. And a beautiful illustration of your point is Hitler. He had vision, passion, and discipline, but no conscience. Gandhi had vision, passion, and discipline governed by conscience. His leadership endured. Hitler's didn't. You make a great point. I totally agree with it. Try to get a mission statement based on principles. That's why we do most of our training programs in the mountains. We want them to get just close to nature, to be quiet, to get away from the social, so they can get a sense of what north is to them. You know the statement I made a little earlier about how if you have everyone participating in an organization, they'll always come up with the same. It's all principle-based. They always do. It's interesting. You can go anywhere you want. They'll come up with the same one. If you don't meet the criteria of have everyone involved, though, what you say can come to pass. You can get Hitler's. Yeah. Uh, you sort of 
spoken a lot about long-term planning. Um, to focus in on a daily routine, how do you get more out of 24 hours in a day? Okay, <clears throat> five steps. First, have a mission statement that defines what is truly important. Second, identify each of the roles of your life. You're a student. Are you single or married? Single. single. You have, do you have uh, social activities? That's a role. <laughs> do you have any community service activities? Church or something like that? That's a role. You belong to a family, you have brothers and sisters, parents, okay, there's a role. You've just identified five roles. On a weekly basis, not daily, if you're into daily planning, all you do is manage crises. On a weekly basis, identify each role and some goal under that role you want to be accomplished, such as your academic role, your student role. I want to get this paper out, I want to be prepared for this test, I want to be prepared for this class, and always set your own deadlines a little earlier than other people's deadlines. Otherwise, you start managing your life by crisis. You've got to develop the moral authority that your life is not a function of your moods, it's a function of your values. Little by little, what happens is your sense of honor becomes greater than your moods, and you develop much more personal moral authority, and people will trust you more. Then outline your whole week based upon meeting those different roles so that you don't neglect your mother, your father, you continue to show an interest in your siblings, you have time for friends, you have time for concentrated work on high leverage academic activities. You don't waste your time on just meaningless work where you just, you know, pound yourself into the ground and nothing, no value was added and you do your church activity, you do any community service that you can get involved in. I'm telling you, if you learn to organize in terms of the context of a mission statement, then roles, third is goals, fourth, you schedule it, fifth, you exercise integrity in the moment of choice. That is, things will come up that will totally throw your whole plan off. Smile about it, and say, what does my conscience say is the most important thing to do? Adapt, be flexible. This is one of our main fields we focus on. Most time approaches prioritize. In my mind, the key is balance, then prioritization. There's a question here. Yes? Um, what do you do in an organization if you're founding a mission statement on principles, you're giving everyone soul for including involving your empowering people? <coughs> What do you do in a situation where you have everything in line, things are going well, and then all of a sudden there's major blindsiding changes that take place? See, that's the power of principles. They never change. You don't commit to practices. You commit to principles. They never change. There are three constants in life. Change, principles, choice. The third one is the power to choose your response to the other two. I have a smallpox scar on my left shoulder because um, when I was a kid, my parents made me get a pulsemox vaccination. I remember crying, not wanting it. They tried to explain, but I was clueless. Eventually I learned I had developed immunity. Pretty well wiped smallpox out of our society today. That's, the significance of that is any problem can develop an immune system inside you. So you get blind by a side of something and you learn, I can adapt to that. And the organization itself, I just left an organization a while back that not only did they downsize, they cut out one entire plant of a small community in Texas where there were only three industries, which meant not only did they lose their jobs, they lost half the value in their homes the media heard about this. They thought they were going to have a media frenzy with national bylines. They showed up at the final meeting, and it was a big party. 
Kentucky Fried Chicken was served, and the media was totally disillusioned because they didn't have any polarizing, negative, fighting influence that they could report on. Why? They followed principles from the beginning. Everyone participated in developing the criteria. Everyone participated in looking at one of the options, which was to have the employees fight the plan, buy the plan. But everyone agreed, so it's obsolete. It won't fly today. You follow correct principles, and the culture will not lose morale. It's tough, though. There's no question, it's tough. And in mergers, it's like a blended family. And for us, it's taken us two years with our merger to come up with the synergistic resolving. It's taken two years. It's been a real tough situation. But it's also been a tremendously ripe source of learning, which I'm going to write about in this book I'm going to come out with called Leadership is a Choice, Not a Position. That's why I was thrilled to take this opportunity to speak on the subject. Yes? Do you think MBA students should take a class on leadership, and how do you think it should be taught so that we can... I think MBA students should take a class on leadership, and if so, how should it be taught? I think in a very real sense that, I think it is good to take a class on that, yes. But I think that every class is a test of leadership, self-leadership, to see if you can, you know, really manage yourself against the criteria that you yourself set up. I think if you did have a class on leadership, I think I would use a lot of experiences. I would have team work to accomplish certain meaningful projects. I would let the grade be governed by the quality of the project which the person put together that made a difference and added value. I would have the other half of the grade be on how well they did on that. I know when I gave my grades, Half the grade was on the basis of the test that the student designed. I've learned that people only know to the level of their ignorance. So get them to design the test. That'll tell you what the level of their ignorance is. Then the other half the grade is how well they took their own test. You cannot ask a question outside the area of your knowledge. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. See, Here's your knowledge. Here's your ignorance. So how are you going to find out where people are at? Have them design the test at the outside edge of their knowledge. I'll tell you another thing I did in my personal leadership training classes. I had everyone write a contract that would truly challenge them and help them grow in four dimensions. There are four intelligences, intellectual, emotional, physical, spiritual. I let them decide what they are and how they wanted to grow. Then they set up a panel of fellow students that they would get feedback from based upon the criteria that they themselves selected. And my job was to be a servant to them and I said to them, I'm going to work for every one of you to get an A. And I would. When I was accused of great inflation by my academic colleagues, I'd say, just test these people. In fact, we had one leadership class. And they said, the syllabus bores us out of our gourd. I said, it does me too. What should we do? We wrote a book on leadership, a whole book on leadership. We delegated it. Different people did different, different tasks. It was one of the most exciting projects. And to this day, we have alumni meetings. This was 25 years ago with those students. I really believe in a lot of spontaneity, openness, and seeking to help every student go as far as the student decides to go. If they're not interested in this subject, I'd say, don't pay the price then. Find subjects that excite you and go toward them. Yes. Centuries 
many centuries ago and uh, from different cultures to, to gain certain experiences to build your own. He's asking, do you draw upon different eras of leaders and people that have succeeded in the past in different cultures? Definitely I do. In fact, we have developed 28 films that show many of the things you're... I wish I'd brought one today. And uh, I use them as part of the presentation. I did a presentation today for five hours. I'll do another one tomorrow for five hours in in uh, Philadelphia. There'll be 1,400 people there. The next day I'll do one for 1,200 people in Washington. I use a lot of those films. I really enjoy them. I think that leadership principles are universal. It has nothing to do with time and place. To me, it's the most exciting subject because it transcends everything in your life. I mean, and, and it applies in any environment you're in. It's never going to be obsoleted. In fact, I think its relevance is growing. It's growing. Yes? Graduating senior advice. I mentioned the ideas I had about getting a job. <laughs> I would say get your life in order. There's four basic needs in all of us. To live, to love, to learn, to leave a legacy. Be sure you attend to all four. To live is a physical, economic one. To love is an emotional, social one. To learn is a mental one. To leave a legacy is a spiritual one. Make your mind up to make a difference. Don't neglect your family. The intergenerational, extended family, not just the nuclear family. Um, don't get seduced by money and by material things. Maybe good, you know, to a degree, but in the long run, what matters is the quality of your relationships with people, the quality of your character, and the quality of the contribution you make. And you'll come to know that. If you've been living on Starvation Alley all these years, you may be feeling, you know, that just sounds like a bunch of theoretical, moralistic, highfalutin, ethical hogwash. But I believe it. <laughs> Our merger took place two years ago, and um, the marketing side of it, the financial side, the product side was really smooth. It was the cultural side that was the test. You had two cultural DNAs come together. It's like a blended family, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh, and uh, we got so inwardly focused upon it that we lost some outward focus on our customers, some of our products, such as we're into planners, you know. Every drugstore has planners now. And it's gone electronic. And uh, so we lost some focus there. And we missed three quarters in our promised earnings, which really caused our stock to go south, which was healthy, really, because it shook us to the realization We've got to get externally focused on our customers, and we've got to uh, move our, our sales team next to our <coughs> clients. So we opened up eight new offices around the country. We brought in a new management team that uh, helped create a new, what you might call, cultural DNA. So things are on track now, and things are going really well. We have 140 stores, all of whom are very profitable. We just wrote off millions of dollars in inventory because we thought we could lead things instead of manage them. So one of the advantages of doing what I do and writing books is that I have a daily laboratory. It's like not just my family, but the business, where I learn the reality of the, of the world. When I was a professor, I was a safe consultant to organizations. But when you're right out there in the battlefield and have to make the decisions and get blood splattered all over you all the time, you learn so much more, at least for me. It's been that way.
Yeah. What is, what is the purpose of your personal organization and how is, that, how is it integrable to the principles in order of priorities that you hold dear? What is the purpose of my company huh? and how does it align itself with the prioritized principles that we espouse and believe in? Um, our purpose is to develop principle-centered organizations, families and societies, communities. So we do a lot of community work. We're into 25,000 school districts. We're into 40 different countries. And uh, we have about 600 million in revenue. Our number one goal is to help create principle-centered organizations. We also want to live and model that ourselves. We find that they are inseparable. The ends and the means <coughs> coexist with each other. Um, it's based to a great degree on the seven habits. A lot of you are familiar with the seven habits, are you? How many are not? a few. Let me just have someone come up for a second. The strongest, largest, six foot three person or larger, come up and wrestle me. You're a wimp. You six three? Six five. Come on up. You're going down. I have a black belt. Is yours black? Brown. Brown, good to see you. Your first name? Uh, Misha. Misha? You're going to lose, Misha. It's OK. It's not size, it's technique. <laughs> OK, now, this is an arm wrestle. So you're trying to put me down here. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to put you down here, OK? Now, the person that instigated, you're coming up here, ought to pay for this. Don't you agree? Sure. <laughs> and that person can borrow from all the people on this side, OK? So if he puts me down here, I, he, you get a dollar. If I put you down here, I get a dollar. Fair enough? OK. OK, now, ma'am, you tell us when to start. Just prepare to lose. You're going to lose. I guarantee you. <laughs> Say after me, I am a loser. <laughs> Okay, start pushing against me now. You tell us when to start and give us about 30 seconds and count the times he puts me down or I put him down each time he get a dollar. Okay? Ready, begin. That's it. That's it. You learn fast. Now look, if we both win, we each get a dollar. You're a fast learner. Okay, now let me, I can teach all seven habits through this little demonstration. Watch. First of all, I arrogantly insulted him to get him into a win-lose frame of mind, and he got there. He was saying inside himself, no way this little bald pipsqueak is going to put me <laughs> Okay? Isn't that right? You were there. You really wanted to win, didn't you? No. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> You didn't want to win? No. You wanted win-win? I just wanted to have a contact. <laughs> I, wondered, I wondered why you weren't pushing back very much. OK, now look. <laughs> most, most people I do this with, they are determined, because I insult them after a while. They, they you know, just still is their resolve. All it takes is one person to think win-win, not two. Again, it does not take two to tangle, just one. Normally, with normal people, after attacking them a while, they think win-lose. But he just wanted the contact. So that's a win to him. That's all I want to do, Misha. OK. So. 
Watch. Think win-win. He's or someone's into win-lose. Now watch. Seek first his interest. Okay? Seek first, always. Mm -hmm. What is it you want? Let me understand your problem, company. Let me understand your industry. Customer, let me understand you. Neighbor, spouse, child. Always understand first. Then, let's say he's holding me here. Hold me here a second. Then, say to them, why don't we both win? Let's say trust is low because I've attacked him. OK, let's let you win again. We'll come up and we'll go down. See, I have to build a trust relationship with him to where he knows I'm trustworthy. Now, you know what's real fast is for both of us to win. Now, we can be really efficient, see? That's where we're really making money. <laughs> this side will owe each of us about $100. See? There's more. Now, look, I did this on the Oprah show. And she just held me here. I mean, I really attacked her right in front of nine million people. I said, Oprah, you are going down. You are a complete and total loser. You are a weakling. You put on extra weight, too. You know, I got her. I got her. And she said, well, she just helped me. I said, she just helped me here. I said, Oprah, why don't you both win? She said, no way. I said, why not? Look how you attacked me. I was raised on the street. Anyone talk to me that way? No way I'd give in to them. See, in her mind, winning means you beat. Mm. Beat the other guy. Yeah, beat the other person. So I said, fair enough, Oprah. Let's let you win again. She said, no way. She wasn't going to cooperate at all. I'd attacked her too much. I'll tell you what, just go slowly up. Now down. Now you've got another dollar, Oprah. I know how bad you need that. <laughs> up, down. Up, down. So finally, you can do this. Now, where did you get the power to think win-win in the face of a win-lose world and a win-lose person, assuming he was, which he's not? <laughs> assuming he was. Where do you get the power to do that? The first three habits. Habit one, be proactive, basically means you're a product of your own choices. Habit two is your choice is to go for a good relationship. That's what he really wanted. Habit three is to live by that choice. Habit four, think win-win. Habit five, seek first to understand. Habit six is synergy, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Habit seven is renewal. See, if we've done this on a key issue that divides us, we could do it on any issue. We develop our own immune system. It renews us continuously. Let's hear it for this good man. Thank you. Thank you. Questions on that little? Yes. Related to that, you talk a lot about how important it is to have a clear understanding of your mission, your values, your ethics. Can you talk about a situation maybe where somebody's values and ethics or, or mission is in complete conflict with your own, where there's no clear win-win? solution and how you've dealt with uh, maybe a challenging experience related to that early. I would go for no deal to agree to disagree agreeably. I wouldn't hire the person. I wouldn't work for the person. I wouldn't deal with the person. If I had to deal with them because um, I was organizationally connected for a period of time or through family or something like that, I may end up with compromise. If you find a higher value that both of you can buy into, let's say a husband and wife team that have fought and been divorced and they have a child, what's the higher value of that child? So the higher value. So long, my friend. Good to see you. Glad to have met you, too. If you can find a higher value, it's kind of like the French motto, liberté, equality, and then what's the one that transcends the two? Fraternity. Because these two values are really divergent. They become convergent when you have a third value that embraces them both. Fraternity. In other words, brotherhood. Love. So, but no deal is very well. I'll tell you another key to know. I'll tell you another key to win-win. 
Always have no deal as a viable option when you start. Let's say I want someone to hire me, okay? But no deal's an option. I'm working with this gentleman. No deal's an option. I'm not intimidated by him. I'll be frank to ask questions. I also want to have him interview me thoroughly to see if it's a real win for him. If it isn't truly win-win, down deep, it's better to go for no deal. When no deal is an option, you're not manipulated toward a win-win agreement. If no deal is not an option, you'll secretly try to manipulate to your own end and call it win-win. But if he doesn't feel it's a true win for him, downstream, pressures will accumulate and it'll break the relationship. If I don't deeply feel it and I just say yes to you because you intimidate me or because you, you say bribe me in some way and I yield it to it, downstream it won't work out. Win-win or no deal. No deal is so unbelievably powerful. I was training Disney one time and I taught that principle and the guy up front said, that's my answer. He flew the next day to Norway to negotiate with the people that were putting in the Norwegian exhibit in the Epcot Center. They had the money, they had the sponsorship, and they were going to put up an exhibit that was esoteric, that would communicate to the world the supremacy of the Norwegian culture in Scandinavia. But it had no general appeal. Disney was ready to bow to that because they didn't have the money to put up that exhibit. And at least it was an exhibit, and people wanted a Scandinavian exhibit. This guy got the concept. He sat there. He said, that's it. He went over, met with the people. They thought he was coming over to capitulate to them. OK, we'll go your way. He went over there and said, you know, we really want this to be truly win-win, something that you feel very good about and that we do. Because downstream, that will nurture and maintain our relationship. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Then let's communicate again openly. Our concern about your exhibit is. But let us understand why you like it. And the person started coming, thinking he was playing softball. See, that Disney was playing softball. This guy wasn't going to play softball or hardball. He just said, you know, if you feel that strong about it, and you really have the funding for it, maybe you should build it somewhere else. And I'm telling you, they backed up so fast. <laughs> Scrambled. Oh, what is it you really want? We want to be at Epcot Center. Honestly, do you ever go into negotiation? Go in with your mind made up around win-win or no deal. You won't manipulate anybody. You don't play games. You're very upfront and open. Yes? How did I get out of the jaded view about about leadership? The students actually, like if they didn't believe in it. Like oh, if they didn't believe in it? Right. I find this. Let the pragmatic fruits of what you do work with those that have the positive energy about it. Sidestep negative energy. That which you resist will persist. Ever find negative energy, sidestep it. Don't pay attention to it. Work with that which has positive energy if it truly works, the fruits of it will become evident to everyone. For instance, we're, we take our material into thousands and thousands of organizations. What's our basic approach? We get those who learn it to teach it. We say to them, if the people you teach are cynical, they don't believe it, smile about it. Don't worry about it. Teach those who are fired up and enthusiastic. When that happens, you get islands of excellence and sea of mediocrity popping out everywhere. And people begin to say, wow, what's happening here? Then you get their attention. Because they're cynical. They want fruit. They've heard all these highfalutin words, and they don't believe it anymore. They've been burned, many of them, and you're guilty by association. 
Smile a lot. Don't let it worry you. Yes? Do you have a list of books, even three or four, that you would suggest we read as graduating and be including some <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love the Drucker books. He's one of my favorite authors. And uh, I enjoyed Clayton Christensen's new book on the innovator's dilemma, bringing out how disruptive technologies tell you, don't listen to customers. Pay attention to your intuition. Read what really was happening. I love Crossing the Chasm. Jeffrey Moore's new book just came out on the importance of realizing that the money is made either right up front or in the third stage, never in the second stage. You see this with the dot-com company, companies. Uh, I like marketing books like that. I like leadership books. Uh, I like Warren Bennis' books. I very much enjoy Tom Peters because he rearranges your molecules. I've worked with him in many, many places. I enjoy his books. Uh, I enjoy reading Fortune and uh, the Harvard Business Review. Maybe that's a naughty word on this campus. Um, do you have a Wharton Review? <laughs> Probably, I'm just not the mayor. Um, I prayerfully study the scriptures every morning and every night, because I believe them. I get anchored in them, I get centered in them, I love them. I study the scriptures of other traditions and other religions. I taught, as I mentioned, in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Dubai out of the Quran. I love that book. In India, I teach from the Bhagavad Gita and the teachings of Hindi, teachings of Gandhi. I love what I call the wisdom literature of all traditions. I find that bottom there's a deeper well, it's all tied into. It's pretty much the same. <coughs> Those are the kinds of things I enjoy reading. Can we take uh, one more question? Okay. <coughs> yes. Being human, we're bound to make mistakes down the road and uh, not follow our And as leaders, how can we be bound to make mistakes? Being human, we're bound to make mistakes, not follow our principles, and what do we do to get back on track and so forth? Well, I'm glad that's a good last question because I'm the same way. And I'm off track with most of my principles most of the time. I'm serious. But it doesn't make any difference. I'll tell you what happens once you develop a personal mission statement. It's like a plane going to a destination. If that's the destination I'm flying to, Philadelphia, I left Harrisburg. That plane was on, off track most of the time. Literally. But it arrived on time. Now, if it had a major weather system or additional traffic we couldn't anticipate, it might have been late, but it would still arrive. You develop a personal mission statement. Then when you get married and have a family, develop a family mission statement. Don't worry about it if you're off track most of the time. You always will. That submarine, I, I was allowed to drive it for five minutes. I could not hold it on track. I would overcorrect. I'm sure there were two guys watching me with guns. <laughs> Back and forth. Learn to say, I'm sorry. I apologize. That was wrong. I saw my son the other day who wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teenagers, which sold a million copies in less than a year. And he had his whole desk organized. Colleen came in, reorganized it for him, thinking it would look nicer, you know, because it was such a mess. And he came in and just about lost it. Took a piece of hide offer. In the middle of it, he said, oh, I'm sorry, Colleen. I'm taking all my frustrations out on you. That is wrong on me. I shouldn't do that. I apologize. I thought, wow, what a man, a person that can come back to it. I had my two sons running down the hall, making unbelievable noise, and I was writing a book on patience. <laughs> and I was starting to lose it. I go out in the hall, and I 
What are you boys doing? Do you have any idea of what it takes to write? The concentration? Heaven's sakes, now go into your room. So I went into the room, and I looked over, and one of the sons was bleeding from the lip. I said, what happened to you? He said, I ran into this wall. We were playing tackle football in a three-foot wide hall. <laughs> I ran into the wall, and David was trying to help me. So I went into David's room, and I said, oh, honey, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you are trying to help your brother. I'm so sorry. He said, I won't forgive you. I said, why won't you forgive me? Because that's what you said yesterday. You're always apologizing. <laughs> In fact, habit five is my nemesis. When I'm really convinced I'm right and I'm tired, I don't want to listen at all. I don't want to even <laughs> pretend to listen. I just want to tell. So I violate the, all the same thing. I'm no mentor or model at all. I don't, I, it's a constant struggle to me. But because of a mission statement and because of getting feedback and making corrections and learning to apologize, I think you can get back on track. So I don't get discouraged. It keeps my hope strong. If I didn't have a mission statement, I wouldn't say that. Our family mission statement is tremendously significant. I had no idea at the time when we did it 18 years ago, the impact it would have on our lives. Now we have kids with, who have kids. So we have grandkids. My mother was involved while she was alive. That's four generations impacted by that. Well, I'll just say a closing word to you. Uh, See yourself as a trim tab person in life. As what? Trim tab. The trim tab is a little rudder that turns the big rudder. It leverages against the water or against the air. And it turns the big rudder and it turns the whole ship. Uh, Buckminster Fuller has on his tombstone just a trim tab. See yourself as a trim tab small influence that can exercise leverage against something of significance that could actually influence significant organizations and society. Make your mind up. You're going to make a difference. You're going to make a contribution. And get focused on something larger than me and mine. And cultivate the habit of integrity including the ability to say, I apologize. I was wrong. I admire you and the tremendous efforts you're putting forth in your program. And I wish you all the best in finding the kinds of jobs you want, the kinds of futures where you can make significant contributions. This has been a tremendously pleasurable and positive experience for me to come on your campus and to speak to you. I want to wish you all the best. Thanks so much.